Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome to the EKG of the Week. I hope you're having a great week, and I'm glad you could join us. This week's case is a 64-year-old male with high cholesterol, but is otherwise healthy. He visits you at your office. He brings this EKG that was completed last week for you to review, and it's shown here. Now, before we get started, let's review our approach that we've been using to interpret EKGs. So notice we have the patient's clinical presentation here above. Below it, we have his EKG. Now on the right side, you can see the list of the areas that we're going to go through. First, you can see regularity, okay, and regularity of the rhythm. This is what we mean when we want to look if it's a regular or irregular rhythm. And then if it's irregular, we want to see is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular. Next, we have the heart rate, and then we'll look at the rhythm origin. That's where is the rhythm actually coming from and originating in the heart. Then we're going to look at the ventricular or QRS axis, which could help us in our differential diagnosis. Then we have the atrial, atrioventricular, and intraventricular IV conduction. And here we're going to look, is it prolonged or is it normal? Okay. And then lastly, we have this waveforms, where we're going to look at the waves, the segments, and the intervals. And then finally, is there anything else? Meaning, is there something that we've missed or still need to mention? After then, we're going to take all this information that we gathered and make a final interpretation of the EKG. Now I want you to pause the video and take a few minutes to go through it yourself. When you're ready, start the video and we'll go through it together. Okay, so our 64-year-old male with high cholesterol and no other significant medical history brings to you his EKG. Let's take a look at it. So first, what is the regularity of the rhythm? Well, on first impression of this EKG, you probably notice that the rhythm appears a little irregular in some areas, but then regular in others. So because it's irregular, but then still has some regularity to it, we call this a regularly irregular rhythm. Okay, so we'll write that. Regularly irregular. Okay. So that's the rhythm. And what do we mean by that? Okay. So if you look at it, notice that these intervals from this R wave to the next look similar. Okay. And even to the next R wave. And then you look here, notice how this is much smaller and then it widens a bit into the next one. Okay. And then remains constant and then narrows a bit again and then widens. Okay. So because it's irregular, meaning that there's, it's not fully regular, but then there is some regularity to it where we see this widening here. Okay. Some narrowing and then widening and narrowing. We call this a regularly irregular rhythm. So what did you get for the heart rate? Remember, this is an irregular rhythm. Okay, so how can we find the heart rate here? All right, so let's just erase some of this here and find the heart rate. So one thing you should know about the EKG is these standard EKGs represent 10 seconds in duration. So if you multiply 10 by 6, that gives you 60 seconds, okay, or one minute. And in order to find the uh, heart rate in these cases with these irregular rhythms, all you do is count the complexes going across, multiply that by 6, and that should give you the beats per minute, okay? So let's do that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, okay? So we have 13 complexes going across, so 13 times 6, okay? And that equals 78 beats per minute, all right? Now the actual heart rate here on this trip said it was 76, okay? So awfully close, all right? So that's how we can find the heart rate, or at least an estimate of it, um, using it with an irregular rhythm. Now, how about the rhythm origin? Well, we have a narrow QRS complexes here, so it must be supraventricular in origin, that is originating above the ventricles. We can also make out clear, defined, similar shaped P waves. So we should look to see if we're dealing with a sinus rhythm. All right. So what do we mean by sinus rhythm? Okay. So if we draw our heart here, this is our right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle and left ventricle. Remember, our sinus nose starts up here in our right atrium, all right? It has its internodal uh, pathways that come to our AV node, all right? There's also a Bachmann bundle that comes to the left atrium to depolarize that area. From our AV node, we have the His bundle that splits off into the right bundle branch, the left bundle branch, and the left bundle branch has a left anterior and a left posterior fascicle, okay? So when we talk about sinus rhythm, we're saying it's coming and starting, originating at the sinus node or sinoatrial node. Okay, now how can we find if we're dealing with sinus rhythm? Okay, so what you have to look for is if you know that it's starting here, the electrical axis, at least that we're looking at P waves, right? Above uh, the atrium, the electrical axis will head in this direction. Okay, so if it's heading in that direction, imagine that on this would be in this 
way, all right? And if you look at your degrees, this is where zero degrees is. This is positive 90 degrees. This is plus or minus 180 degrees. And this is negative 90 degrees, okay? And the normal P wave axis actually lies between zero degrees and positive 75 degrees, okay? And if you look here, notice we have our axis going in that way. So it should have said somewhere between there. Now, if we add our leads here, this is where lead one sits, the positive end. This would be AVF, okay? Lead two is here, lead three on this side, all right? And then we have AVR, that's there. And then we have some of the precordial leads, V4, V5, and V6, okay? So if you look here, that it's heading in this direction, meaning that those leads over here, we have a depolarization wave heading towards them, we'll see upright P waves in those leads. And because it's going away from AVR, we should see a negative P wave in AVR, okay? So let's see what we have going on here. So here's lead one, notice the P waves are upright, okay? Here's lead two, again, upright P waves. Three, a little hard to make them out. Here's AVF, another inferior lead. You can see those upright P waves. Okay, if we go to those left lateral precordial leads, here's V4, upright P waves, V5, okay, they're there, and V6, okay, they're hard to make out, but they are certainly there. And then if you look at AVR, we can see these inverted P waves, okay? So we have that. Now, other criteria for sinus rhythm is that we have to have a P wave coming before each QRS, okay? So the P wave cannot come after it, all right? So if we look here, look at our rhythm strip, here's a P wave. This is a QRS complex, a P wave, QRS. This after it is a T wave, okay? And then if you continue looking through, here's another P wave, QRS. And if you go throughout this, you would notice that there's always a P wave before each QRS complex, okay? And there's always a one-to-one -one ratio of one P wave for every QRS complex, okay? So because we meet all that criteria, we are in fact dealing with a sinus rhythm, okay? So the rhythm is originating from the sinus node, so we call this a sinus rhythm. So how about the ventricular axis or QRS axis, all right? Now you should have gotten a normal QRS axis. The actual axis here was positive 15 degrees, okay? So it should be normal, and we'll look at that, and it is positive 15 degrees, okay? So let's look at how we find the ventricular or QRS axis, okay? We say ventricular because uh, we're looking at the QRS complex, okay? So you can may also hear it known as the QRS axis, all right? So how do we find this? Well, again, this is zero degrees, positive 90 degrees, plus or minus 180 degrees, and negative 90 degrees, okay? and what we're doing here is look, we're going to look at a few leads, all right? Now, we usually just have to use two unless we're dealing with a leftward axis. So in this case, we'll only have to do that. So here's lead one, sits at zero degrees, the positive end. Here's positive 90, where AVF sits, okay? And we're going to use these leads to help us, okay? So if we look now at lead one, notice that our QRS complex, which is this one here, is mostly positive, okay? And because it's positive, we're gonna be heading towards the positive end of that lead, okay? It's towards zero degrees. And then if we look at lead AVF, okay, here's AVF. Again, notice that these QRS complexes are mostly positive. So again, we're gonna to head towards the positive end of AVF. That puts us in this region, all right? So where is normal axis, okay? Well, normal axis actually lies in this range, right where we are. This would be leftward axis deviation, okay? This is rightward axis deviation, and this is extreme right axis deviation, which is uh, quite rare and sometimes referred to as no man's land. Now, really, normal axis lies if you want to be specific, from this negative 30 degrees to positive 105 degrees, okay? And usually with children, you have more of a rightward axis because remember in utero, the fetuses, the right ventricle is acting more as the dominant portion, the dominant uh, ventricle of the heart, whereas in adults, you know, the left ventricle then takes over. So things eventually start shifting leftward as we get older, okay? So we said the axis here was positive 15. So positive 15 would sit about right here, okay? Again, within our normal range, all right? So the ventricular or QRS axis here is normal.
Now, how about atrial conduction? Well, typically we look at leads two and V1, okay? Those that we can see the P waves in or the atrial abnormalities, okay? The V1 is a good one because it gives us a short axis where we can look at both the left and right atrial abnormalities. Now, the P wave duration appears within normal limits here. That is less than 120 milliseconds or three of the small boxes, okay? So if you look here, you can see some of these P waves. Okay, those are actually biphasic P waves in V1. So what do we mean by biphasic? Well, it looks like this, okay? And the beginning portion represents the right atrium, and that latter tor terminal portion is the left atrial uh, depolarizing, okay? And why is the initial portion of the P wave the right atrial depolarization? Well, look where our sinus node is starting, right in our right atrium, okay? So the beginning portion is right atrial depolarization, the latter portion, the terminal P wave is that uh, left atrial depolarization, okay? And we said the total duration of that of our P waves should be less than 120 milliseconds, okay? And we see that here, all right? So our atrial conduction in this case is normal, all right? So next we have atrial ventricular or AV conduction. Well, in this case, we're looking for any conduction delays as the impulse travels between the atria and ventricles. Because the majority of the PR interval represents AV nodal conduction, we're going to look there. The normal PR interval in adults is between 120 and 200 milliseconds, or three to five of the small boxes. Here, the PR interval is within normal limits. The actual value measured here was 148 milliseconds, okay? So 148 milliseconds was our PR interval, all right? And that's within our normal range of 120 to 200 milliseconds, all right? So our AV conduction here is normal. Now, just to review, what is our PR interval? Okay, so let's look at what the PR interval is. So here's a complex. This would be our P wave, our QRS complex, and our T wave. The PR interval is from the beginning of the P wave up until the beginning of our QRS complex, okay? So that's the PR interval. Don't confuse that with the PR segment. The PR segment does not include the P wave and comes after it. So it's this portion here. Okay. And that's our PR segment. Okay. So don't confuse those two. When we look here at this AV nodal conduction, we're focusing on this PR interval. Okay. Which appears within normal limits. All right, next we have intraventricular or IV conduction. Here we look at the duration of the QRS complexes. Normal QRS duration is often between 80 and 110 milliseconds or two to three small boxes. The main thing we're checking for with IV conduction is that the QRS interval is not prolonged anywhere. We can see narrow QRS complexes that appear within normal limits here. In fact, the QRS duration is 82 milliseconds, okay? So the duration here, of the QRS is 82 milliseconds, which is within that 80 to 110 millisecond range. So our IV conduction is normal. There's no interventricular conduction delay, okay? And again, we're looking from, in this case, from the beginning of our QRS complex to the end of it. That's what we mean by the QRS interval, okay? Now, how about the waveforms? Well, the P waves we said are most likely normal here, right? There's no significant P wave prolongation or increase in the amplitude in leads two or V1 or elsewhere. There's no abnormal Q waves present that may signify a, you know, a former or prior MI. The T waves are present, they're asymmetric, and they appear normal. T wave amplitude is typically greatest in leads V2 and V3, which we see here. Here's V2, V3. Notice our T waves are the most prominent here, okay? And again, T waves are tend to be lower in females. This is a male patient, so they're uh, have a higher range, okay, and they tend to decrease with age. Now, the PR segment is not significantly depressed or elevated anywhere. The PR and the QRS intervals, we said were within normal limits. The QRS amplitude appears normal. The ST segment does not appear significantly elevated or depressed anywhere. And then we have the QT interval, which appears within normal limits. So overall, there are no major waveform abnormalities. Okay, so remember the QT intervals from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of that. That's our QT interval, okay? And we're saying that there are no major waveform abnormalities. So we'll put normal here, okay? So is there anything else we're missing on the EKG? Well, not that I can see. The R wave progression in the precordial leads appears normal here, okay? So what do we mean by this R wave progression? Well, what we mean is that, let's just erase some of this here. As we go across the, our precordial leads from 
the right side to the left side. So from V1 to V6, okay, the R wave should increase, all right? And you should have an increase because we're going around towards the left side of the heart. Remember, the left ventricle is the most dominant uh, portion of the heart, makes up the most muscle mass, okay? So when we look at our R waves, okay, the R wave is the first positive deflection after the P wave. So this would be an R wave here. This is an R wave here another R wave, okay? And notice how it increases. You want it to increase from V1 up to V5, okay? And if you have that, that's what we call normal R wave progression, okay? And we see that here. So normal R wave progression. Now the transition zone in the precordial leads also appears uh, to occur between leads V2 and V3. Now the transition zone is simply the where the precordial leads area where that QRS transitions from mostly being negative to being mostly positive, okay? And the actual transition is the area where the QRS is actually isoelectric. Normal transition occurs between leads V3 and V4. If it occurs earlier than V3, then it is called a counterclockwise rotation or early transition. And if it occurs after lead V4, then it's called a clockwise rotation or a late transition. So because it occurs before V3, this is technically considered a counterclockwise rotation. Okay, so let's just look at that here. Okay, so what do we mean by that? So we said here's V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6 are precordial leads. The normal transition should be between V3 and V4. Okay, and what do we mean by this transition? Well, notice how this is mostly negative. Okay, mostly negative. And then when you get to V3 here, notice that this R wave here is greater than the S wave amplitude. All right, meaning that the transition occurred somewhere between V2 and V3, okay, closer to V3. And we said if it occurs before V3, okay, so in this area, we call that a counterclockwise rotation. If it were to occur after V4, we call that a clockwise rotation, okay? So this is a counterclockwise uh, rotation or an early transition. Okay, so either way you can call it that, all right? Now, one thing to keep in mind with R wave progression and transition zone is that it's highly dependent on lead placement. Okay, so what is our final interpretation? Well, we have a regularly irregular rhythm with sinus origin occurring at a normal rate in a normal axis, along with normal atrial, AV, and IV conduction as well as no major waveform abnormalities. So this is a case of sinus arrhythmia or sinus rhythm with marked sinus arrhythmia, okay? Or we can simply call it sinus arrhythmia. So let's just write our final interpretation here, okay? So this is sinus rhythm, right? Originating from the sinus node, okay? With marked sinus arrhythmia, okay? And we'll take a look at sinus arrhythmia uh, so you have an idea of what that is, all right? So just a few words on sinus arrhythmia. As we saw, sinus arrhythmia does, does originate from the sinus node, okay? Hence the name of it. Although it has varying rates, it's defined as B to B variation in the P to P interval that results in an irregular ventricular rate. The variation in the P to P interval should be greater than 120 milliseconds or three small boxes, okay? So let's just take a look at this. Um, sinus arrhythmia. Okay, so you know what this is, all right? So remember, we said when we were going through this that we're dealing with a regularly irregular rhythm, okay? So this is not a normal sinus rhythm because there's some irregularity to it. And what I want you to look here is if you look, here's a P wave and there's the next P wave. So we call that the P to P interval. And notice how that's different from this P to this P interval, okay? And if you were to look at that difference, so if you count up the number of boxes from this to this and then subtract it from that to that, if it's greater than three small boxes or 120 milliseconds, that's what we call sinus arrhythmia. And if you have that constant variation, okay, and it's not completely irregular, uh, that's where we get this from. So you'll see this P to P interval gradually lengthen and shorten in a cyclical fashion, and it often corresponds to phases of the respiratory cycle. Therefore, sinus arrhythmia is generally benign in a normal physiologic phenomenon. The heart rate varies due to reflex changes in the vagal tone during respiration. For instance, during inspiration, the vagal tone decreases and hence decreases the heart rate. And then during expiration, vagal tone is then restored, thereby decreasing uh, or increasing the heart rate, okay? As we restore that vagal tone, right, we're then uh, decreasing the heart rate.
So I may have mis misspoken there. During inspiration, the vagal tone does decrease, okay? And because it's decreasing, decreasing parasympathetic activity, we will have an increase in heart rate, okay? And then expiration, we're restoring the vagal tone. So there's a relative increase in vagal tone and parasympathetic activity parasympathetic activity so the heart rate will decrease okay hopefully that uh, I didn't confuse you there now generally the incidence of sinus arrhythmia decreases with age which has been attributed to age-related decreases in carotid distensibility and baroreceptor reflex sensitivity there's also something called non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia which is less common and not related to the respiratory cycle this is typically seen in elderly patients and has a greater chance of being pathological it can result from digoxin toxicity or some sort of heart disease. Anyways, in conclusion, our 64-year-old male with high cholesterol has an EKG that shows sinus rhythm with marked sinus arrhythmia. Well, that's this, the end of this week's EKG of the week. I hope you learned something. Please don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below if you like what we're doing. In fact, many of you have asked how you could help us out. Really, the best way would be to simply subscribe and share this resource with your friends. You get free access to more than 300 videos, including both pediatric and adult courses, something I wish I had when I first started. There's also a community of over 100,000 of us like-minded individuals on Facebook. So stop over and join the EKG Guys Facebook community. Lastly, your feedback is incredibly helpful and your kind words are always an encouragement on those long days. Thank you again for your support. It is truly appreciated. We're the largest, fastest growing EKG resource in the world.